uh, of the Turk, for example, on the crest. Thank you very much. So you saw that it, it, it was wanted to hand this around. Is that all right? Mm -hmm. So you can kind of look while we're doing it. Mm -hmm. But so that's what we really want. We wanted the big recouche, we recouche crest. We want certain elements. Now there are and and you'll see. Well, you'll, so what you'll see is you'll see design elements repeating. We try to use a lot of personal imagery, of course. I mean, here using the, the wyvern because that's my on my coat of arms. Uh, and and you'll see recurring imagery of angels and of lions because I'm very much on Tyrion at heart. If you don't know, this is Master Google. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we said well, this is this is how we want to do it. So you take the helmet, for example, and we say, well, I want uh, what do we want on the top? Do we want a mermaid like the one in the, in the New York Museum of Modern Art? Do we want a uh, do we want a Turk? Do we want uh, I don't know an Atlantean king? What do we want? <laughs> you know, bound and draped over the top of the helmet, right? And Miles wasn't available for. Uh, Modeling for the King of the West, so we said, let's do an angel. Actually, I called my wife an angel, so I, we said, I want an angel. I said, I want an angel at the top of the helmet. So how are we doing that? Because with the other one, the angels were holding down the Turk by the mustache, right? So how do we want to do that? Well, so I want, I want the wyverns there, and I don't remember which one of us came up with it, but I said, why don't we have the angel draped over the helmet, holding swords at the necks of the, at the wyvern on each side? And uh, we thought there was lots of really entertaining symbolism in that particular one. Uh, and that's what we ended up going with, it, as you see. And then for the, uh, for, the, uh, for the breastplate, this is an early sketch of what we kind of wanted the breast. One of the, actually, this is, a, this is a late sketch. Yeah, that's because we went through several iterations, as you can imagine. And what about this? Should we do this? We, what, what are we going to have in between, et cetera? And in Milan, uh, just down the street from the Negroli workshop is the cathedral, the Milan Cathedral, the Duomo. And in Il Duomo is a famous statue of St. Bartholomew, who was martyred by being skinned alive. And if you look at the statue from behind, you see this man, this bald man, standing there like this with a robe draped around him. And as you get closer, you see that he's not bald, he doesn't have skin on his head, he has muscles, and you get closer and you see nerves, and you see veins and arteries, and you see tendons, and as you get even closer, you see that he's not wearing a robe, he has his own skin draped around him. Uh, and it's this amazingly beautiful statue. And, and it has some significance, because St. Bartholomew was a physician, and not a physician. And, and St. Bartholomew was the patron saint of Milan. And the, the Negroli workshop was in Milan. And so we thought, what about using a concept of like a flayed face uh, and, and a recurrence? And if you look at the back of the helmet, wherever it is, you, oh, she's found it. <laughs> in the back of the helmet, you'll see pictures, and you can see it itself. So we have the flayed fa face of St. Bartholomew. And then on the, on the breastplate, we have, we have that as a recurring theme as well. And this is an early concept of the shield. And the shield as it turns out, was the very first piece that we started. So you yeah. want to, and I'll just. Yeah, sure. Uh, so what are we So we'll so, uh, so we to pass the shield. I'll pass the yeah. shield around while you're doing it, and then you can start so, talking and I'll kind of advance. So the shield was kind of a little bit of an homage also to us here, obviously. And um, it was actually yeah, where I, you know, when they ask you, you know, if you're, if you're God, you say yes. Can you do this? I was like, yes. And so I figured I'd start with the lion to get, you know, the, the rust taken off me. And uh, yeah, so the drawing based off that little sketch that I did, and I had it enlarged, and I found a place to make the uh, shield base because it was just a little difficult to get something that big. You know, the, the flatteners had special dyes and stuff like that. You know, so I decided to start with the represent process, which is basically you get the drawing on top of it, uh, start chiseling little by little, and then yep, there it is. It's kind of cool. Uh, I don't know. Just narrate the pictures. I got your back, man. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so what I always do is I start on the right, my right side, simply because my brain just works better that way. And um, I'll try to get this, the right side done as much as possible during the chasing and the repose. Most of what I do is, is actually chasing. Repose is when you work from behind. I only really work from behind to push the ball in. Um, yeah, so I was trying to get the line based off of the one that I saw. It's not a Negroni, it's, but it's one of the Invalides, which is the uh, Musée de la Vente in, in Paris. 
I was able to travel to Paris and research some of the real pieces. And uh, I really want to get that pearl brow, which to me was you know, to be able to get that weight of flesh into metal. Um, to also prepare me for the future stuff that I was going to do. So there it is. You know, you'll see little points. Well, not in this one, but in other ones, you'll see little points. And those are my center lines. What I do there is I will then get uh, calipers and I transfer the measurements kind of, you know, from three points and try to get the rest of the place equal. Um, Okay, um, there's there's going to be probably about 15. Oh, yeah, okay. So that's why I know. Are you talking about the process at the time or yeah. whatever? So, um, oh, yeah, the, the fur. Everybody goes crazy about the fur. The reality is, the fur is just you got to follow the lines of like the skin and everything like that. And as long as you get the directional lines, it really trips the eye. A lot of this is tripping the eye. It's not necessarily, I'm sorry, I'm still getting over a little bit of a that in poisoning, so I'm a little more jack sparrow, so forgive me. Um, the directionality of, 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 the, of the hair, you know, a lot of this is like some blood. You know, basically you're tricking the eye into believing what you see. A lot of what we see in SCA type of armoring is people are actually trying to sculpt these pieces in, in 3D, you know, in the round. And the reality is that the, the stuff that I saw in Paris, the Negroli stuff, is incredibly shallow. In fact, some to the point where um, there's almost no sculpture in it, but what it is, is it's catching the eye, catching the light, and that's what happens with all the fur. It catches the light, and it gives the impression of fur, especially because it's going in the, in the you know, in, in just like human hair, you know, it just goes in the direction of the skin, the direction of, of, of natural growth. Um, and again, you know, continuing, yeah, continuing with the mane, trying to get a little bit more of that curled hair, you know, and, and I learned I've done hair before, but learned on this one that you know it's like in sculpture you just don't do hair. You know, um, uh, not from this brush. Albert Durer had a guy come to him one time saying, "I want the brush you use to do hair." And uh, Albert's like, "Yeah, sure, here." Yeah. And the guy comes back really angry. He's like, "What the hell, man?" I think he, he thought it was like Photoshop or cut and paste. <laughs> um, and and Durer goes, "No, no, this is how you do the hair." And he actually shows him how you do the hair to trick the eye. And that one brush, you know, like my tools, give you a, the, the illusion of hair. It starts underneath, it comes above, and then it ends up back underneath. And a lot of that flowing, which they did a lot in the Renaissance, Bernini, Michelangelo, all those guys, did this. If you look at their hair, it's not actually hair. They're just clumps that are tripping the eye into believing it. And then, this was, it took forever. <laughs> <laughs> because I had to like go through and, and also because everything is not exactly the same, you know, just like our own faces, you know, were, were not equal. If it was totally perfect, it becomes a 20th century modern industrial look. And that's what you don't want to do, but you also want to give it a little enough where it doesn't look amateurish. So there may be some differences here and there, but they kind of work. Uh, there was an artist, I believe, of, I'm going to get all weird here. There was an artist, I can't remember his name, he did a a bunch of paintings of, of beautiful women from, from behind, and uh, there's one where she's laying like this, and she actually has, I think, like three extra vertebrae, right? I, uh, you guys might remember who it is. Might be Degas, I'm not sure. But because of the way he did it, there was a lot of guys that were pulling on the guy. But because of the way he did it, he was able to pull it off. Because if he did it with, without the three extra vertebrae, her chin would have been here. You know? And the same thing with these, you know, if, if you can do it just right and get away with certain um, imperfections in the anatomy because it actually adds, you know, this very human, but at the same time, animal, you know, very fierce and concerned, right? It looks concerned, like, oh gosh, what's going to happen? Oops. <laughs> yeah, and then of course, play of the light, now he looks angry. And I love that also in sculptures where you get that, depending on how the light gets, you can change the mood. So here again is the, is the helmet design that we had, had uh, finalized, as it were, before the actual start of construction. This was uh, the piece I was, we were talking about in the Museum of Modern Art in, in New York. This is an, also in the Groley. And this is the, so you see the position, in this case it's a mermaid. Uh, but uh, you see the positioning of the, uh, in the use of the, of the human or humanoid figurine and the crest 
And uh, this is very much the inspiration. As we, uh, if you have the helmet around, look at the look at the serratus muscles on the angel, and then look at the comparison <coughs> to the uh, to the mermaid here as well. And some similarities you'll see some design features, the way the hair does, the armbands. Clearly, we've elected to use a different, you know, demi-human type figure. But uh, uh, and here's the the shot from the top, and you see uh, here. Uh, kind of a Medusa-like uh, grotesque face as well. Uh, again, tying in what we put in the nape, whereas they may have used the, uh, the green man kind of a... Yeah, the green man. Mm -hmm. um, this was also my way of tying in the look and the feel of the Negroli world family. Not necessarily trying to be a Negroli, but kind of go, oh, you know, homage is also, you know, tying in certain things. Um, the way that she's laying down holding on to the, to the Medusa head. She's in the same place holding the swords. Um, wanted to give it the flow and, and the feel of it. You know, and I, I did pretty well. I actually had a, a girl modeling for that. Didn't quite work, so I used Monica Bellucci uh, okay. as a, as a <laughs> model. I actually used Monica Bellucci as a model for that. And my wife declined. And <laughs> so again, the, the, another shot of the of the, the Negroli or one of the Negrolis that we also used inspiring. Okay. Here with you. This is the one in the Royal Armory in the big. Yep. Yeah, that's the beginning of, of this helmet. Um, what I do is I tend to I will build a shape and I fabricate. I don't bother raising. I can, I have, but at the same time, it's not about raising. It's about the piece done. It's about getting the piece done and, and about getting to the good stuff, which is what I really want to do, which is so cool. Um, so it's, it's got a well down the center front, and I think over here somewhere. But I learned through Mac. I don't know if you guys know Robert McPherson. He's really, really, he makes me look like a special. Um, he tends to weld with the same material, and then if you do it just right, you can't even see the welds. So it's really difficult to find the weld, and also when I, when I raise it, because I fabricate it, and then I finish raising it from there. Um, so then I get the volumes of what I need, so of course I need the body on top. I started with her, because otherwise, let's say I did a beautiful job, and then the body cracked or something horrible happened. <laughs> It'd be bad. So this is where I was using my ex-girlfriend, and she's very, very sporty. And you could see it was very muscular and thin. And then I said, no, no, this won't work. So it's, and of course, I was having all these left and so on. Um, so getting the body was, it wasn't really a challenge. It was just tedious because it's a new thing, a new technology, not technology, a new skill that I was working out on. And then I realized that it just, I, I was a sculptor before I was an army. So basically, it was just simply building up the volumes and refining it back into the piece. Um, well, as you saw in the other pictures where there was a big bubble, you know, I created, I make it a little bigger than it needs to be, then I tuck it back in, which is called chase. Uh, here I'm laying out the dragons because, you know, you gotta get it just right, like where it looks right. So I erased it, I erased it so many times until so Ali was happy with it. You know, I was always sending him pictures as well. And of course, because, you know, he's a doctor and stuff, I really want to get the muscles right. <laughs> so I did a lot of research on the subject. It's horrible. <laughs> uh, but it really, and, and also, Doing it to where it has a little bit of the Renaissance body type. You know, we're all used to seeing the, the modern ideals of female beauty and all that stuff. But being able to get this beautiful body that's very feminine, also muscular the way they did their hair, the you know, and at the same time, sexy. So I really enjoy taking the time on that, getting all that. And that's just hammer finish, that's not uh, polishing or anything. Yeah, and then the whole time I had that, and I also had a book of anatomy next to me. He <laughs> <laughs> was like Grey's Anatomy or one of those. Uh, yeah, Grey's Anatomy, the thick book? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know. The thick book doesn't narrow it down when you talk about Grey's Anatomy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I love the art. I put this shot in there specifically for the art. Mm -hmm. It's one of my favorite parts of the book. Uh, the whole thing is my favorite part of the book. But I really enjoy trying to get the anatomy in there as much as I can because there's a certain beauty and perfection in it. and also to be able to make it in steel. When I see Bernini being able to do this stuff in steel marble, it blows me away. Because if I screw up, I just push it out from the back. If, if, if I screw <coughs> up, maybe I weld a piece, because I did screw up on one piece and hopefully you brought it. Um, but Bernini, if he screwed up, that was it. You know, I think they made a certain glue out of lime and something else that they did use on certain pieces. But in stone, come on, you're like, Oh crap! <laughs> <laughs> um, 
there was a story about Michelangelo was doing a, a sculpture. Oh wait, that's what I was No, that's, that's the story right there. There's a story where Michelangelo was doing a sculpture and the Pope was like, you know, he went to uh, I think you're doing this wrong. He's like, no, no, it's good. Because he didn't want to sculpt it. He says, no, no, the nose is too long. Like, it looks just like your nose. It's good. So he grabs a handful of marble, uh, marble dust, and he goes up there and he puts it here and the chisel just it makes it all fall. And he goes, what do you think that is? Oh, that's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, this piece is when I start in the face. Um, there's a small issue is that there was a well going through here. And on the original face, they kept messing it up, and it was just something that happened. So I ended up taking a chisel, popping the face off, and then I put a new face in its place. It was a little plug. And I was able to hide right there the well. It looks like a little curly hair, but it's actually a well, and it goes around the face. And I was able to hide the, 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 the well in the head. So, in effect, basically, I uh, uh, saved it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And the hair. Uh, again, this is another thing about the hair. Uh, they did some really fine, beautiful detail on the hair. I was trying to capture the same thing. It's my own brush strokes, you know. Uh, I'm not trying to copy the girl, I'm trying to do as much as possible to capture it. But in the end, <coughs> we all have our different brush strokes when we do stuff. So somebody cannot be expected to do stuff like I do. Like I won't be able to do stuff like the girl is completely. But it's, it's a goal to be able to do it. It's kind of like raising a helmet. It, it bores me. Uh, there's people that can do that, that do that all the time. For me, it's not about raising the helmet, it's about getting to the stuff. And, and and I, I, I also selected this piece particularly because throughout the, throughout the work, I mean, I had this concept starting out that, oh, I've got, I got Ugo, this is already going to be fabulous, you know, right? And not really understanding the same process that I go through and we probably all go through, that, but especially a project of this magnitude, my skill and his skill at the beginning of this project versus the skill at the end of the project is quite different. And you can see that even in between the, uh, the, uh, the hair pieces from the shield and the hair pieces from the angel, and then some of the, the, some of the pieces. The, the, the line from the shield that. and the line from the shoulders. Uh -huh. uh, they're the same family, the same vibe, but you can really tell. It's, it's just kind of it's a little more alive. So there she is. I, I honestly, I've never done sculpture. Uh, not sculpture. I've never done portraits of people, but I was trying. I was really trying to get the right with them. I was really trying to, and, and you know, this face is the portrait. So it's kind of, um, Maybe that's a better picture. That's that's more close to <laughs> <laughs> I was just trying to divide them, um, and that was just a lot of. The face took me a very long time, but I was loving it because I actually had to make special tools to be able to get in there. And I, I wore like plus three reading glasses to be able to just get in there, and, you know. And again, no polishing, just kind of finish. You know, getting a typical nose, which is that kind of beautiful with the little things. And this again, trying to impress, you know, the doctor, you know, getting veins in there, all of that stuff. But getting um, the tendons and getting the, you know, the wrinkles in the wrist, you know, yeah. the, the, the muscles bundled. You know. We actually had several discussions about where exactly the level of the hem of the garment should be. <laughs> and then fabric. Uh, on this piece, I was able to finally be able to do the weight of flesh, the feel of, of hair, uh, fabric. I have a degree in fashion. And one of the things that we drilled into us, obviously, is just learning how to draw the fabric with gravity. Um, pulling it how it falls naturally. It can be a difficult thing, especially when you're on top of the helmet when gravity is telling you to be going this way, but you, you're, you're creating it in a, in a, where you suspend the, the belief of, of gravity because it's a, it's a piece done in the round. So for her, where she's sitting, in, in the place she is, that's how the fabric should lay. You know, if I was doing something else, I could do some crazy, crazy helmet with the fabric going around the helmet, which she might be cool to do. But for this, and I wanted her to be her own element that's laying on top as if she's flying over it, you know, catching the dragons. I'm afraid it was fun. That was more like me going. There you go. Again, they're just chisel marks, really. The whole thing is just chisel marks. And, uh, um, 
discussion about um, how we wanted the overlap to be because I was very clear that I wanted the I thought I was very clear that I wanted the wings out the, of the angel and we got and we got that uh, but some original designs were that the the dragon wings were coming up toward the toward the body of the angel and the angel wings were kind of down or kind of draped almost in a more classic angel style but the, when, when we when we hit on the idea of, of the of the wings overlapping uh, I really think that that is a really great way to, to put that depth in, yeah. that 3D depth in, and to trick the eye without, without a ton of raised work. So at this point, or actually a couple of points back, uh, maybe one more. Um, okay, this, this, yeah, at this point, because I remember it had that marker, is when I took it, I actually snuck it, uh, well, I didn't snuck it, I took it to Europe with me. Uh, and what happened is, uh, I really wanted to see this when I was dating a girl over there, heartbreak. And uh, <laughs> I wanted to see it next to one of the real pieces. So I actually snuck it into the Museum of Automate. And that piece is actually in the yeah. cool. And it was really cool to be able to see the, actually see the real pieces next to one of mine. And be able to compare you know, the depth of their representing. Now, or chasing. Now this is after I come back because that's when I realized it doesn't have to be so deep. But the girl, the, the angel, she's supposed to be. The crests are always really powerful and strong and big. And I'm glad that I took it because now at this point you'll notice that the rest of the representation starts becoming really shallow. So that's another uh, point where you study my pieces. You'll see, oh, something changed here. And usually, obviously, there's a reason for it. You're evolving and learning from this stuff. So this, since you can see it passing around. You realize how little, how shallow it really is. Again, back in the uh, but still, you still have to have that artistic. And so this is this is a lot of fun too, because I was still. I mean, we, I, we we started this project not too long after I moved to Spain, so there was a lot of stuff that was happening <coughs> via these pictures coming by email, and the internet in Spain is not nearly as fast as my internet. And so it was a regular thing to be biting my fingernails as I was waiting for these updated pictures from Google and Lowe and Lowe. Well, it's like you hear the Not that slow, but yes, that's certainly what it reminded me of. So here's the shot you're talking about. Yeah, and what this the story was, I'm sitting there, and there was luckily, this day, there was a lot of people trying to get in, and all the security like being, you know, checking everything. I don't know how he got in because I had the backpack with armor. We're going through people's backpacks. And I kind of just went, beep, beep, and then snuck in. Somebody goes, they checked your bag, and I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, sure, and I kept walking. <laughs> so people came in, and I'm sitting there, literally like a stalker. I'm just sitting, looking at this, there's a bench over here. And I'm kind of sitting there, and I'm waiting for not too many people to be around, but enough to sort of those can see. And I see this kid next to me, and I go, hey, speak English? Where? I'm about to find And I'm like, you want to see something, kid? You know, and it was, it was one of those. <laughs> <laughs> and I opened the bag and like, look in the bag. And he's like, mon dieu! <laughs> <laughs> so I want to get a picture of this. Would you help me? You know, I just, you know, so, no, so we don't get caught. Um, um, I'll hold it out. No, he helped. You hold it out and I'll take a picture and then throw it back in the bag. And he's like, yes. So <laughs> some pictures, because I noticed people over there were starting to notice. And it was just very strange. So this is actually like, because the other one came out where it was a line and it just looks almost Photoshop, but this one was laying on top. You know, and of course my eagle was kind of like, yeah, close. <laughs> <laughs> close. That's before I put the first edges in here. Now the, the dragons, um, weavers, uh, they, <laughs> um, I really wanted in the design process, and I know we were talking about it before I came in. Uh, in the design process, I really wanted to touch on his, um, Norse persona as well. Okay, so there's a lot of double meanings to these things that there was in history. Um, if you notice, they're women's, but they also have a little bit of a beak by a you know? And if you look at the claw, it's got the curly claw. Okay. 
downstairs. Yeah. So this would be even that's before I would find it, I think. Yeah. But there's a bee, you know, it's kind of a, sh you know, kind of a weird birdie looking, you know, wiggling. And then the, the, the claw, you know, what I really wanted to do was throw in some uh, allegory, you know, so, some double meanings to everything. So St. Bartholomew, because, yeah, there's a little goth in there for him too. He's a doctor, it makes me happy because it's food. Yeah. Um, this because of the, <laughs> maybe just wanted to put some evil stuff in there. This because, um, and, because okay, there's there's a victory or the angel on top over two dragons, but it could also be the Valkyrie, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, over the two crows, the ravens. Jeez, I'm so not on to <laughs> Norse mythology. Uh, so I put in a lot of stuff like that. So I wanted to touch with his um, double persona type stuff. Yeah. And, uh, the cool thing is you can see the pictures, you can see the real piece. So it's almost like I, I I'm explaining double, but. This is, you know, before I gave the final little thing, because you want to have the wrinkles in there and then you smooth it and it just kind of gives it a softness. And my favorite part was the, the last part I did on the helmet for the roll of the face. Um, <coughs> I think I did that after my second trip to Europe where I, where I actually had more time to just sit. I probably sort of switched the lens in all the other places and was able to see other art as well. And just the way, even in Marvel, they also did a lot of very, you have the name, it's a very low, low uh, relief type sculpting. Okay. So if you go, uh, yeah, bar relief. And what happens is, uh, <laughs> all of this, again, it's, it's really shallow and catching the light. And, and the way you get it is at the very end, it's a sort of crisp, it's not necessarily a cut underneath, but it's a nice, a nice crisp edge. Uh, like if you look at coins, if you look at the relief on coins, they're really, really shallow. It's almost not there. But what does, again, sound like a broken record, catches the eye. And really that's what you have to do is click the eye believing that that's flesh. You know, then it puts stubble. If he was joking around that it was me, if I would have thought about it, I probably would have made it with one of them, you know, the Mickey Mouse forehead. <laughs> yeah, it was the played face of St. Lulu between us yeah. for a while. <laughs> yeah, and I really love this piece. I have a, a guy who's the closest thing to a teacher I've had, who's, his name is Valentin Yanko. He's a Bulgarian. I took a class from him in, in Tuscany once, and um, he saw this because he came to visit, so I he grabbed the helmet and I took it up to where he was teaching, and you know, kind of like did one of those, and he just sat there, and he just said, I have the whole helmet, I love this, and he just kept touching it. <laughs> 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 Any other questions? Yeah. 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 Yeah
the spoils or the shields or the uh, of the uh, of the defeated foe at the at the base of the at the base of the column or at the base of the tomb. And so we came up with this idea of shields, and then uh, a couple of pieces that you see uh, were very specific to me. The uh, uh, the rapier here, for example, very clearly uh, my rapier. Uh, and next to it, the effect of Corbin. And again, a direct nod is a very, very specific, very, very personalizing pieces. And this, and I we have a better picture of it. That's not pointing. Right, no, exactly. But so you see them coming out now. So here's, as it's being developed, here's a, a, bundled rod, a, bundle, a bundle of rods, and inside that rod is called an axe. And this was the Roman symbol of rulership. You actually still see it all over Europe today. On the, the symbol of the Guardia Civil, the center of the National Guard of Spain, you have, you have that symbol. And it was very representative of these rods with an axe. And the Roman emperor, not the Roman emperor, the Roman governor, would have somebody carry this behind them when he was processing through the street. It was a very direct reminder that he had the authority to beat you or <laughs> to kill you. And so this, uh, again, tied into the heroic style, the Roman rulership. But there's a great there is closer to pick. And the, and the shot of the rest, yeah. too. Um, I really wanted to get the feel of mourning and weeping and, and, and all that um, for the fallen, for his fall, right? So this kind of like they're, you know, celebrating, but at the same time weeping for the fallen. Um, or or they're, they're also about to preparing to take him up to that honor. Now on this, I think you're thinking of doing some dance scene, right? right? Well, we'll talk about the way next. <laughs> Right. So, <coughs> we'll go back to your, uh, the little dot. Yeah, that little dot, those are dots that you'll see every once in a while. And I've actually found stuff like a little scratches on certain period pieces to find uh, the centers. Um, and I'll use those. And you know, I, I try to get rid of them, but sometimes I can't, and I'm just like, turn to a feature. Um, yeah, so that was fun, because you see it, it's teeny tiny, and that's what I use my new tools on. So I kept asking if this was some sort of, you know, Rock and roll symbol. Show. <laughs> <laughs> There's the near finished. All right. All this. So the lines, of course, being a motif that is historical for rulers and stuff like that, but also you know the Antillean, the um, thing, you know, the line. Uh, so I really wanted to, to, to do a, you know, a fun job with those and, a, and also make them very wearable. Um, when I was in Paris, I was able to really study because they have a few of those suits over there. <coughs> and uh, again, the pearl brow. I mean, I really wanted to get that in there and just check that feel. You know, I'm pretty happy with that. There you go. Yeah, as I'm doing this, I'm like, damn it, I want to keep it. <laughs> you know, this was an accident. Uh, this picture was actually at the lab, and I took a picture, and I was going to erase it, and I looked at it, and I'm like, oh, that was really dramatic, so I kept it. <laughs> uh, it's very cinematic. Uh, plus, it gives you a lot of the look of how the, how the, the light catches certain lines, and those are the, the lines that just give it that fleshy kind of vibe. This is also a good example of how I was uh, unintentionally driving Google crazy over the course of the year or so. Is that he's very much interested in keeping his name out there in his own business, right? And showing what he's doing, and, and et cetera. And I really wanted this piece to be a, a, a bit of a surprise. Maybe not a complete surprise, but a bit of a surprise. The unveiling be something remarkable. It was completely serendipitous that I won the crown, and was able to do so at a, at a 12th night kind of situation. Because oh, you can't have <laughs> <it. laughs> but, uh, but so he would beg me periodically, can I, can I give a little teaser picture? Can I, can I show something? And so he, he ended up doing so many teasers and so many people just happened to stop by his shop <laughs> <laughs> that uh, we were calling it the worst kept secret on tier for close to a year, I think. Oh, this is kind of fun. You see the point there? Point there. This one I did without drawing at all. What I did is I grabbed that one, it's supposed to be the center line, and I literally copied it. So it's like a, a pentagram. But, <coughs> copied everything over and that's when the drawing came is as I was transferring the, the measurements mm -hmm. and that was tedious. I mean this is one of those things where I um, 
I don't want to say I didn't plan well. It's just I didn't realize the scope of the project. Uh, some things take as long as they take to do right. And some things take the time they take to this business. You know, it just takes the time it does. So transferring the measurements takes forever because you want to do it just right. And then I don't only have to those measurements here, but then I have to measurements over here. Um, and then it starts coming alive, you know, just, oh, that's cool. <laughs> so then they'll look at it like, oh, I can do this. <laughs> and then we wanted to get the, uh, oh yeah, that's uh, Jim Caviezel in the background. He's a guy that played uh, Jesus in the Passion. Mm -hmm. uh, I did some stuff in the office and afterwards and I wanted to keep one of his heads. <laughs> so I use that for measurements on certain helmets. Um, I have a couple of heads that I use for uh, measurements. <coughs> And here I'm trying to get the feel of the shape. You know, I didn't put a roll on it yet because I wanted to make sure I didn't cut too much off. Uh, and then you'll, you'll enjoy on the back plate, you'll see the little spring clips. Uh, I really wanted the armor to have as little leather as possible shown. So that's what uh, those straps are, are Bryn helping with those. And there's these little spring clips that hold the, the mm -hmm. pollen on. <coughs> you see it at the very top of it. I wanted to get this. Is it? Yeah, and I have a picture of the, okay. uh, the one that modeled it off. And there were a couple of reasons for doing the rare race in this in this style. Uh, one was a beautiful period example of it. Down below you can see the uh, the, the heavy face plate. Uh, so in the helmet, as we, we didn't actually talk about, it actually has three interchangeable face plates. So it has the parade face, and it will have the heavy fighting face, and it has the rapier face. And if you were if you're watching the race you're fighting at Ursula, you probably saw me uh, wearing this thing. This was the very first time I tried it on. And it looked glamorous, but it was in a parking lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right outside of McMinnville. He was wearing a t-shirt on the ice cream Yeah, and it was funny, no padding, you know, screws holding it together, you know, I'm worried that he's going to get all you know, impaled. Fortunately, I have a skinny neck. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and you haven't rolled the edges of the no. yeah. the yet. Yeah. So here's a piece, and I put this as a final piece up because I wanted to show some of the things that we purposely built in. So some of the, some of the features that we built in, uh, you see through these recurrents, uh, I'm just going to show up very well on this, maybe a flip up slide. Let's see, you see on the piece. You see there's this flat space <coughs> behind the lion but before, before the rope. And, and it's very consistent. You see the same on the other side. Then you look up here, look, that's the same there, right around here, around the edge the same kind of thing, and then protected pieces or, or areas that were specifically, very specifically designed and left to be flat steel. We didn't mess with it at all. Maybe there's something like these beautiful scaled looks, right? But, but our goal was to use those for something else, and so it's kind of a phase two kind of a set. Here's a shot that I took in my living room yesterday with the rapier mask on. And the gauntlets. The gauntlets, yeah. Those are, oh, I think they're the copies. Um, so, okay. following in with his, his, his uh, device, his, his coat of arms, <coughs> you have, you have, you have Wyvern, Wyvern, and uh, yeah, Molotovay. And Molotovay. And Urban, counter, counter. Yeah. So, what to do with the gauntlets? Uh, because these are a little longer than they would have had in his time period. These are more like um, bridal gauntlets or whatever. But they look really cool. And also, he was going to be fencing them and stuff like that. And normally when they did represent on these, this was a, a short cup. Raphael, you want to pass It was a short cup with, uh, you know, really nice represent and foil and stuff like that. This one, you know, we want to make it longer, a little more impressive. We thought about putting like three of those there. I was going to do something crazy. And then I thought, no, the simpleness of it would be great to just do is just one instead of three on each one. So he does have three on his, on his coat of arms. So he's got one on each gauntlet and then one on the tip of his. And there's a. Did you see the meme? Somebody did The what? The meme? I saw a couple of memes. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. What was it? Uh, something about swooning will be given to you or something like that. <laughs> no one expects the branch in juxtaposition or <laughs> But this was taken by a camera, who, of course, is a professional photographer. But we knew that this was a remarkable opportunity and a coincidence of being able to wear the crown and the regalia and having this kind of stuff. And so it was, it was, it was, uh, I, I get the pictures quick, before 12th night, because that, that's my opportunity to go on. So that is the, uh, 
Now, the question is what's next? So project of what's next is uh, very specific. So when I was looking, so these are some more pieces that I snuck in the, in the Royal Armour in Madrid. Uh, and this is of the back of a horse, of course. But I, I'm looking at these things and I say, OK, well, I, I understand what this is. Oh, that's some beautiful chasing work. And I get in, and sorry, it's hard to hold a cell phone very still and poor lighting. And I say, okay, this is beautiful gold work. I see what this is. This is this is some chase work for the relief, right? And this is gold. This is gilt. This is gilt work. I say, I, I understand that. I can I can relate to that. I I know how to do it from an electroplating side, and now I know how to do it from the fire gilding side. But at the time, I, I didn't know. And then I look at this piece again. So remember, this is the Negroli shield that we saw at the very beginning. And I say, well, that this piece, that's that's gilding. I get that. Okay, I, say, well, I know how I know how gilding is done. But this, this is clearly not gilding. This is this yeah, is not. Same. And, and then I look at this piece and I say, oh wow, you know, here and here on the blade and up the blade, a poor picture, at least in this light. And it's 400 years old or 500 years old. So. Uh, there's that too, but uh, again, not gilding. What are they doing? Here, hey, that's gilding. Okay, I gotcha. We'll do it again. We can paint on the mercury and aluminum. And then this example. <laughs> this is very, very hard. Now, is this, so I say, is this some kind of an inlay? And I'm familiar with what, the, what we use inlay modernly now, where you, where you, you chisel a channel. And you, you chisel a channel and you kind of dovetail inside the channel. You put, you put in this case, gold wire into the channel, you hammer it over the gold wire, conforms to the dovetail of the state as an inlay, right? And that's called, a, uh, the Spanish call that an open box inlay. Uh, but this is not that. And so I said, well, what is this stuff? The floral patterns, they were getting a terrible picture, I apologize. But here's a good example of some of the details on the mask's garniture, one of our inspirational pieces. Uh, the legs are the same. All of the legs have these, have this gold look. And then you look at this. Now you see where we got the ideas for, <coughs> for the for the pauldron pieces, the rare brace pieces, where it's actually a strip of steel, but it's it's very chased, so it looks like individual scales. And look what they did with the individual scales. So I had to find out what what is that, and then you know, see what is this. You know, this I understand. I can encrust something. I can attach. I can make this like a, a, a shallow rivet and put it onto a piece. You know, and encrust it with silver in this particular case. But this is not done that way. Nor is that an open box inlay. And so it actually took a lot of. I kept coming across this word, um, the Massini. And or and, and so I, I I said, well, what what is that? How come I have been in the SCA very interested in armor for a lot of years, more years than I care to admit, and I have never seen this and I've never heard of it. Uh, ignorance, I guess, in the past, but it really brought it to my attention in the Royal Armory. And then you see these examples in gold. And it's a very old technique that apparently is around from the time of the Greeks and the Egyptians. There are early examples as well. But it's a different way of inlaying. It's not an open box inlay. It's a different way of inlaying soft metal onto a hard metal. These are obviously examples of gold onto the steel. And so I said this, from the very beginning, I said this is what we want to do. So you see that protected area behind the roll and and, uh, and, and then some specific like the shield shapes there and the squirrel designed specifically for in a flat space designed for, in this particular case, the, uh, the really beautiful floral twisting patterns uh, there. And I said, and I, oh, this one, I, 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 it took me a half an hour to get this shot in the Royal Armory. Because I really, really wanted a detailed shot of this, um, of that particular design. And I said, that's what I like, that's beautiful. I want to take that, and here's an example of one in the Royal Armory, but with all the, with a bunch of gilding, and a bunch of people seen. And I said, I want to do this to the bike. And so, uh, uh, I ended up going back to Spain to learn the technique because uh, it turns out there was one person in North America that I could find on all the jewelry sites and and uh, forums. Does anybody know how to do this? Does anybody know how to do this? And there was one gal who was a professor, <coughs> of, uh, a jewelry professor in Canada, living in Nova Scotia. And I 
said, I want to learn how to do this. And she says, well, and I happen to have just accepted a job in Vancouver. So wait till summertime and, and come. So I went and I learned this technique. And I said, this is a neat technique. This is cool. But it doesn't look the same. It's not, it's not what I'm seeing. It's not what I'm seeing here. It's not what I'm seeing there. It's not, it doesn't look like this, which is a silver version, even though that's black and white, the real piece of silver. I said, it's not quite right. So I said, well, where else can I learn it? She says, well, I learned it from a guy from Spain. I said, OK, so I start looking. And uh, there are still two cities in Spain where this art is still practiced. As it turns out, there are 43 people left in uh, the world, as far as we can tell, still do this. And the youngest is 42 years old. So uh, I, it took quite a bit of convincing. But I ended up convincing one of the Damascino the art, uh, uh, artists to agree to teach me. And at first I said, and I finally, because I'm showing the pictures of what we've got so far, the Damascino-like technique that I learned from a really nice gal in Canada, that's redundant with a really nice gal. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, uh, and finally I said, look, I'm not going into this blank. Can you, can you at least please teach me? He finally says, OK, OK, I'll teach you. How much time do you have? And I'm like, well, I can make time. I, a bunch of, I can spend several weeks, you know, I, you know, I, maybe up to six weeks or, or whatever, and then come back if I have to. He says, no, minimum year and a half. <laughs> I said, well, that, that's, that, that's not really financially feasible. So, uh, but we talked some more, and he eventually agreed to teach me anyway. And so the next step for that, well, actually, I did go to Spain. And I'll tell you more about that experience if you go to um, Kingdom Arts and Sciences, because I'll be doing a lecture only on the Masquinado at, at that, at that, at Kingdom Arts and Sciences. But he did eventually agree to teach me. And so the next step is this, for the armor, or something, something is similar. <laughs> so imagine as it is, and you look back at this piece here, and this piece right here. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at the pieces in the collection, all the Damascene pieces, none of them were originally metal colored. They're all black. And 400 years of enthusiastic polishing <coughs> by museum staff has taken most of the blacking off. But even on the other pieces that look mostly metallic, you can still see there is the blacking in the indentation. And there are only a few pieces, in this case an entire set, in this case it's just the helmet, where you, you can really see how it actually looks. And, and the blacking is, is, is part of the masking. But the, and it just makes the gold and the silver just pop like that. Uh, so that's that's the goal. I mean, it looks beautiful, and the steel work is incomparable. Uh, I uh, I do not say it lightly that when I tell Ugo that this that I believe this is the finest suit of armor built in the last 400 years since the early workshop closed. Perhaps it is it is the finest example of this style that has been built. And then I say, now let's let's do that to it. <laughs> so is it done yet? No. No, I'm not satisfied enough. So, so that is my project. Oh, when, it's when it's finished. When it's finished. When it's finished. So that's my optimistic project over the next year and a half or two years is to, is to right now I've, I've been afraid to touch. I've done a lot of Massini, but I've been afraid to touch these yet. <laughs> and I know from your experience and from my own experience that the piece I start first will not look like the piece I do last. But uh, uh, just uh, as terms of what's next, that's what we want next. That's, that's what we want next. I have been sneaking pictures through the whole process of my friends in Europe, all the best friends that uh, curators and stuff like that. You know, it was really a pain because, yeah, it is one of those things because of what I do. Uh, like, the, uh, the Seventh Sun just came out yesterday. And that's a movie I worked on two years. The last thing I worked on, no, the whole Smith project was before I started on this project. And not being able to show any work for two and a half years was torture because to get work in my industry, I have to show work. It's really weird. Um, so the way I was able to get around it and feel like I got, if I have some curator friends and, and friends, I'd send them pictures. Well, it started going everywhere. And there was this one guy who was a, a conservator, in, 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 an armor collector conservator in, in Geneva. Who I didn't get to meet with, but he was going nuts. He was looking at these pictures, he showed it to him in black and white, just to mess with him. He was looking for this just to get his opinion. Oh, look at these pictures I found. He's like, oh, well, it's not going to grow, but it's, hmm, well, it could be like 
Uh, Tacho was, was a guy in Paris who was the first conservator uh, at the Metropolitan Museum. Um, Daniel Tacho? Daniel Tacho. He was incredible. He was rumored to have done Ripuze. He did, when you see these old black and white pictures of this face that is done in, in parts, you know. Which um, is actually one of Yeah. That's done by Daniel Tacho. Uh, so this old man starts freaking out, going, I have to see this because it looks like a Daniel Tacho camping camp. He's freaking out. My friend's like, okay, okay. And he explains to him the whole thing, and the guy's going nuts. And I've been hearing all these stories, so it's kind of humbling and exciting. When I saw him wear this thing the first time, complete, it was the same time as the uh, I, I ran in with uh, the gauntlets and the boots I made for him, and the puffed and puffed until he was ready. Right now. The freak out. So I was kind of with everybody else just staring at him going, what is this thing? And yeah, it freaked me out when I made it in. <laughs> so it's humbling and, and, and yes, my hands a little bit too, of course, but come on. Uh, <laughs> That's true, to see it more to see it. Um, so it's one of those things where, yes, it is, if I stop building armor right now, I'm happy. Uh, part of me wants to move on to fine art, part of me wants to continue doing this stuff. But I don't know when I'll be able to do something like this again and be able to afford the time to take it. And now that I know better and know so much more, um, how could I, I don't know, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> it's kind of freaky. <laughs> this will be hard to talk. Yeah, yeah, so maybe I just stop. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now I have the, the financial question. What's the bottom line? Oh, we don't talk about that. <laughs> no, quite seriously, and not just in matter of materials, but in the matter of time spent. If you look at it, if you look at, because I've done some studies, if you look at, you know, the SCA is a certain market, then there's other people, that, uh, other groups, that sure. have higher markets. Um, if you look at it in, in, I think they've done some studies, in the comparison of what uh, a person, a, a noble, would have paid for a suit like this, compared to today, it's like uh, buying a Learjet. It's like, you know, so it's, even back then, it was relative, you know, it was very relative to the um, So this, Yes, it's, it's not cheap, but at the same time, it's going to be an error because it's getting uh, mannequin and all this stuff. I mean, the guys, you know what? I was thinking about carving a hole in the second mannequin, so you put your eye in it. <laughs> 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 so, what about bottom line on a dinner stove? How do you get it out? Yes. Oof. I work anywhere between, honestly, sometimes I just work six hours, other times I work 14 hours. So, really, I can't pick the time. I could tell you. It took me a year and seven months, I believe. Um, out of that year and seven months, I know 45 days of it was spent in Europe. And uh, I had an artist crisis, which maybe took me out another two weeks total. Um, ends up that I thought I had anxiety and depression. Ends up I had a, I had an issue with caffeine, and I was eating things with a lot of caffeine. <laughs> and I was having uh, basically tachycardia and all kinds of crazy things, and I thought I was going crazy. And I stopped the caffeine, and I just, oh, <laughs> So, yeah, a year and seven months ish. But it was when he was talking about that. I mean, well, we found out a couple things. One is that I was better negotiating than we were. But the original concept was how long is this going to take? We're guessing maybe 12, 13, 14 months, right? Yeah. Plus or minus a little bit of full time work. And so that's when we, we contracted. I said, well, this is what, that's what we're paying for then. And uh, he gave me, I think he gave me a discount because he, uh, it was a project he really wanted to do, as opposed to the KDs. Uh, he was technically able to do, but it wasn't really his passion. Right? So when he mentioned it, so uh, so cost-wise, I won't give a number, but I will say I paid him to go full time for about four months. A, a double question: Are you tempted to fight it? And did anyone in those in those fancy 16th century armor did they fight in them? Both excellent questions. So. What I do know is that yes, I will be fighting it, and I've already fought rapier in it. And when the heavy side is complete, like you see, there's no elbows, you see, there's no knees. This is very much a raid. I don't even have cassettes, you know. Uh, so uh, yes, I will be. I, I do plan on fighting it. How much? I don't know. Especially after I get the gold work, and I really, I really don't know. Because <laughs> that's that's going to change things a lot, as you can imagine. Maybe you know, you have to do another quick piece. Special thing. Yes. There we go. But the, uh, uh, as, as terms of, I was asking that question myself, because this clearly 
and the example pieces, they clearly do not look like they were designed to fight it. Because you look at the ones, you look at the garnitures for Carlos V, for his combat, they are smooth. There are no, I mean, they're beautiful yeah. and well done. But there's no raised edges that get balls or spears or whatever. There's not, it's smooth. And so, very clearly, when Carlos V went to work, he wasn't wearing this stuff. When he was, to, when he was parading, or when he was in court, he was wearing this stuff. And, but that said, there are <coughs> examples in the Wallace collection and in the Royal collection with sword marks on them. And I saw some in France. And in France, too. I did not know that. And so that's the question, then. What is that? Did, did the king actually fight in it? Did the king's 16-year-old son bust into the armory and play with swords with some friends? I have no idea. <coughs> or we have no idea. <coughs> but there are uh, existing examples with sword or with, you know, cut type marks on them. So somebody fought in them, at least in a, in a few of the examples. Yeah, I was talking to my friend, uh, Nicholas, the curator, and he, he had the same answer. He's like, we don't know if it's the curator's kids, because he grew up in uh, one of the castles with some friends. Um, in Branson, in Switzerland, and he said that they would put on suits of armor and chase around, chase themselves around the, the, house, the castle all the time, beating on each other. You know, they get in trouble for it. And he's like, "Well, we did it." He used to say that, you know, throughout history, when they weren't so, you know, uh, uptight about protecting these things, we don't know. But the ones I saw in France, they look pretty. Uh, you know, they had a couple of little slashes here and there. Um, but 